Pow, and welcome back to another episode of the Sum Elevate podcast. We have a very special guest with us today, Kevin Dunlap. How are you doing, man? I'm doing well. Yourself? Great. Thanks for being a part of this. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's always, I'm always help, willing to help out people that are uh, wanting to uh, prosper and grow. So it's my pleasure to be here. Awesome. So this is Kevin Dunlap, an operator, coach, and entrepreneur strategist. He is a uh, author of Designing Your Own Destiny and an upcoming book called The Winner's Code. That's awesome. Tell me a little bit about that book. Well, The Winner's Code is a book that's mainly about mindset because um, the, uh, the working uh, subtitle is either Secrets of the Winner's Mindset or Creating the Winner's Mindset. So I'm not quite sure which way I'm going to go yet. Mm -hmm. And the book is mainly about, I described that there's, nine, uh, there's eight main different mindsets out there. Only one is the winner's mindset, which is the one that operates from the win-win uh, uh, so st strategy. Everything else is a version of win-lose, lose-win, lose-lose. Uh, that's what the other seven are based on in the short term and the long term. So the new book is essentially it's about helping people understand where they're coming from and not only their relationships, like their relationships with their, their significant other, their spouse, their children, their in-laws, their parents, but it's also about their, uh, how are the, how are they uh, showing up in the workplace? How are they, are, are they a management of a manager of other people or are they, uh, you know, with their coworkers or are they even an entrepreneur? How are they showing up with their clients, their customers, their vendors, um, the general public, uh, even their employees. So it's, it's all about recognizing where you are, what kind of mindset that you're in, possibly also the mindset that other people are in and how can you make this a win-win? Uh, one of the, it's based off, the whole book is based off basically one quote. Mm -hmm. and it was a quote by Zig Ziglar. And his thing is, if you help enough people succeed, you're going to succeed yourself. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. That's great. That's really fascinating. So how did your journey start for you in terms of coaching and uh, being an author? Um, the being author actually came about, came about after taking two back-to-back -back classes in 2014. Um, one was through a, uh, a company at that time known as Peak Potentials. Now it's no, known as Success Resources of America. And it was a class called Train the Trainer, which is how do you train from stage? It's a five-day class, very intensive class. Uh, and when I tell you the hours, most people are just like roll their eyes like, no, it, the thing is, if you're committed to be a trainer, it doesn't matter how many hours that you're there. So the class normally ran from nine o'clock in the morning and usually let out between midnight to two in the morning. So it was very intensive class. Yeah. So it's like, like, oh, we, we, we have to come back after dinner. Yes. Now you're going to come back after dinner. You're going to come back after midnight dinner. And then the other class that I took right within like three days of, the, of that class was the ladies uh, woman's class. Her name was Lisa Sasevich and her class was called Speak to Sell. No, actually this was, um, what was it called? It, it was a um, uh, un unlimited sales boot camp. Sorry, I had to look at my notes. Yeah. Um, and it was, both of them were about being on stage and how to make an influence. Mm -hmm. After taking that course, uh, within, I think it was within like five months, I wrote my first book, which was, which was on real estate. It was called Lease Options Made Easy, which you can find on Amazon. Mm -hmm. So it's a book on lease options or rent to own real estate. That came out in, 2000, in January 2015. Um, shortly after that, I started seeing, I, I actually hired a book writing coach. And in October 2016 is when my second book came out, which is Designing Your Own Destiny. And okay. that book was about figuring it out. It's a, it's a workbook and a book in itself. Yeah. It's about figuring out what is it you want to get out of your life and how to make a game plan in, in creating that. Doesn't matter if it's relationships, business, career, doesn't really matter. It's figuring out what is what is true for you, and what is it, that, and how can you actually achieve that uh, achieve that goal. Now, the That's winner's cool. mindset yeah. came to me at the time of the recording of the show five weeks ago, and it took me three weeks to write the book. The second book took me ten months to write. The, the third book yeah. took me about three. I'm right now at the recording of this episode. I'm in the editing phase. I'm about, you know, I'm looking for editors to go and send the book to, and I would like to launch it within the next couple of months. So it's uh, it's a true passion of mine. It's a platform that I'm using now for speaking engagements, 
and uh, it's it's just a, it's been a phenomenal journey um, since you know, over the last four years. That's really fascinating. That's great. Um, so, what is a winner according to you? <laughs> I win a person that operates from a winner's mindset instead of just being a winner, because a winner can be construed different ways depending on your perception. Definitely. But somebody that operates operates from a winner's mindset, yes, they're going after something that they want. Yet they are also um, they, um, but they're not doing it at the expense of other people. It's like, hey, uh, like say for me, a winner's mindset would be somebody that operates from, you know, I'll, that's, that, that, that operates from, hey, how can I win? And, but like I said, being on your show, like, hey, that I know this, you're not paying me to be on your show. How can I, you know, help you win by giving hopefully value to your, uh, to your audience? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. That win-win mindset is very interesting as opposed to, uh, a win-lose which is more from a competitive frame this is more of a collaboration um, uh, so. correct the win-lose because i have three different mindsets that fall in the win-lose category mm -hmm. one i'm calling it is the egotistical or, or the egocentric it's a person that hey you know what i'm gonna win if you win great if you don't win i don't really care yeah. the other version of that is that is that mindset to a more extreme i call it the taker mindset is the person that comes in like I'm going to win at all costs. I'll, I'll step on you. I don't. I'll take you down. I I just don't care. Mm -hmm. And and that's a that's egocentric to a much higher level. Now, if you get the egocentric and go to a slightly different direction, I call that the pretender mindset. That's the con artist. That's the manipulator. That's me. Hey, hey, I'm going to be your friend. I, I'm going to you know pat you on the back, but secretly I'm trying. I'm I'm t I'm taking your wallet out of your pocket and taking money out of your pocket. I mean, I'm doing, I'm faking my friendship with you to get what I want. So those are all different kinds of win-lose. Now, yes, the, the person uh, uh, in that role, technically they're winning, but they're winning at the expense of other people. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I could even be here doing a win-win as a pretender. Uh, I'm helping you succeed, but I'm only doing it for my own self selfish interests. Mm -hmm. So it's technically still a win-win, but it's, it's the mindset, it's the thought pattern, it's your, right. it's your concept. What, what is the overall goal there? Mm -hmm. So how can somebody use the, um, the winner's mindset, let's say, in the example of relationships? Well, because um, I, I put in some tools in the book, and the, uh, a lot of the tools are, are in my second book as well, in the Designing Your Own Destiny book. But how you, let's, let's say we're in, uh, in relationships. So I want to be a little bit, uh, a little bit more specific. Let's mm -hmm. assume how, do I, how can I win in a relationship with my wife? Mm -hmm. okay. One thing is I find out what she wants. I find out you know, what is this that she wants in, in her career or what does she want with her relationship with her mom? What, you know, what is it that she wants? And then how can I be there to support her in the way that she needs to be supported? Right. So if I'm there for her and I'm genuinely, and I, I don't know if you've read the book, The Five Love Languages by Gary Chapman. Uh, for, for those of you that haven't read the book that are on his show, it's a phenomenal book about relationships. It talks about the five, you know, we all speak uh, five love languages. And if her love language is different from mine, how can I support her in her love language uh, so, that she feels, so that she feels appreciated and loved? So that's how, that's how it works in a relationship. Now, sometimes it may, it may not be your default way of how you want to react. But the thing is, how, how you asked me that specific question, how can I show up in her life? Uh, or you can put this for your kids, you can do it for your parents, you can do it for your coworkers, you can do this for your employees. I mean, how do you show up that they feel appreciated or that they feel supported or that you're gonna help them achieve the goal that they are wanting to, to achieve? That's how, you, that's how you, in my opinion, how you show up from a, from a winner's mindset from that. Now, I'm not going to say one of the other mindsets that I have, which is a lose-win mindset, which is, uh, I call it the martyr uh, mindset. That's the person that always puts other people first at their own detriment. I'm not saying to go to that extreme because now you're no longer operating from the winner's mindset. So you, you do it to the where they feel appreciated and you still ben are benefiting from that. Uh, from that interaction hopefully Great. that makes sense. yeah that makes a lot of sense so in terms of communication in a relationship having that mindset 
definitely in the back of your mind helps to really be directive in terms of how can I help this other person and what do they really want and understanding the the love languages helps as well and uh, have you read the five love languages no I have not but I've heard of it many people have brought it up to me well, I, I'm going to go over because uh, an ex-girlfriend of mine, or his girlfriend at the time, I gave it up to me. So I'm going to just describe it in a nutshell, but I still suggest you get the audio book or the book itself. Yeah. And the five love languages are, and they're in no particular order. I don't remember how they were introduced in the book. Um, so one of them is going to be what is called words of affirmation. So mm-hmm. Some people feel loved by, hey, uh, Hey, you're doing such a wonderful job. You're, you know, you're such a great provider. You, know, you by giving them compliments, you telling telling your wife, "Oh my gosh, that that dress looks absolutely amazing on you. I love how you how you, what you did with your hair." People get up, uh, they they feel loved by those kinds of words. Mm-hmm. Um, another one would be something known as acts of service. That's doing things for somebody. Like, hey, you know, I'm I'm going to go take out the trash without you having to ask, or I'm going to make you dinner, or mm-hmm. I, you know, you're doing something for somebody else. Um, the girlfriend that introduced this to me, that was her love language. Her number, her primary love language was acts of service. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll explain a little bit more in just a moment. The third, uh, another love language is gifts, or sometimes known known as tokens of endearment meaning I'm, I'm buying something for you. Now, it doesn't matter if it's a big jewel, uh, a diamond-crested uh, necklace or if it's just a, a $1 flower that you picked up. It yeah. is not the fact that you're receiving the gift. It's usually the fact that you are actually going out of your way to do something special for somebody else by giving that gift. It's the thought. It's like, hey, you were thinking of me when I wasn't around. So that's some people feel appreciated by gifts. Um, if you're a, 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 a fan of the, the TV show uh, Cheers from way, you know, way back in, way back when, Rebecca, which was play, played by, uh, um, I've got her name, but she, she was obviously gifts. She's like, you know, she was always like somebody bought her and said, oh, look how nice this is. So she was very much a gift oriented, which is not a good or a bad thing. The, the next one, it would be what is known as um, quality time. Uh, by just us spending time together you know we're just going i don't care if we're both sitting and reading a newspaper and you're reading a book we're just spending time together in, in a room just you know just 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 spending that quality time with the other person and the fifth one i always need this fifth because a lot of men men think this is their love language and i usually say bs on that because i don't know if you personally show or not um it's what's called as physical touch mm-hmm. you know like holding hands uh, cuddling whatever the reason I say a lot of men uh, consider, I think physical touch is their number one love language is because that, in my opinion, this is not Gary's opinion, the, the author of the book, um, is that they confuse sexual activity with physical touch. Now, yes, they are together, but I, I will always challenge every man, like, if you, if you think physical touch is your number one love language, then after having sex, you love to cuddle. Then okay, then I will agree with you. You love holding uh, your 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 partner's hand in public. Then yes, but if you say no to that, then I say, well, let's not because let's let's. And this is my opinion. You put uh, the, the sexual activity into acts of service instead of physical touch, and then and then uh, or then reweigh the scale. Yeah. Now, when uh, my ex girlfriend, my girlfriend at the time, introduced this to me, one thing that she always loved to do was make me dinner. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, my two love languages are physical touch and quality time. That's, that's me, hands down. Mm-hmm. Her, hers was acts of service. She loved to make dinner. Usually, how I would uh, express love back to her after dinner was, let's put, the, uh, let's put the leftovers away, put the dishes in the sink or the dishwasher, and let's go uh, sit on the couch, watch a movie, cuddle, and, and, and I just be with each other. But since I knew hers was physical, t- excuse me, was acts of service, instead, um, I would actually, I, I would put the, le- the leftovers in, in, away in, into, the, uh, into, in, into the refrigerator. We, I would then uh, put the dishes in the sink. I would wash the dishes. I would dry the dishes. And then I would put them away in the cupboards. And that, to me, was showing her appreciation to her love language because I'm doing services for her to show my appreciation for that. That's not my default language. I would not, before reading the book, I would never would have even, that would never even entered my conscious mind. 
because I would be more, hey, to spend time together over, over here. Mm-hmm. But knowing that hers was acts of service, I knew doing this made her feel appreciated. So it's, I'll definitely check out the book. And yeah, it seems really, uh, really profound in that way that it shows you uh, what another person is really, uh, how they oh. communicate with themselves also. It's like, it's a way that they also have this language, but it's also what makes them them. Well, the thing, what it boils down to, and, it, and it's called a language, because usually if you're speaking English, you understand, if you're talking to somebody in English, they're going to talk back to you in English. So mm-hmm. the same with love language. If you're express, because how you express, how you demonstrate love to somebody else is usually how you want to feel, uh, feel it back. So without even thinking about it and her doing, her doing the dinner thing and spending all the time, I knew hers was acts of service. So I shifted my love language for her so she would feel appreciated and then she would know hey let's go cut on the couch because she knew that was my love language Mm -hmm. so so it's 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 not the winner's mindset would say hey well how would she feel appreciated or he it doesn't matter what the gender is how would that other person feel appreciated and how can i express in their own language so that's great i'll definitely check it out um and in terms of using the winner's mindset, let's say, as an entrepreneur or somebody who wants to uh, start their own business or looking towards uh, that building that entrepreneurial mindset. Uh, recently, somebody told me that being an entrepreneur is like jumping off a cliff, but you're figuring out uh, a way to build a parachute on the way down. I think it was you know, uh, what something Hoffman said, but I thought that was really interesting. Uh, what are your takes on the entrepreneurial mindset in terms of the winner's mindset as well. Well, with, with, with being an entrepreneur, that usually means that you're doing something different and you're doing, like you say, you're jumping off the cliff and figuring out how to build a parachute on the way down. Um, it's because as long as you, as, as when you're starting a business, you're actually looking to actually help other people. It's not just, Hey, I'm just doing this for the money. Mm-hmm. Then, then if you are honestly doing it to help others, then you will figure out a way. Mm-hmm. For example, being being a coach is I, I'm doing this and I'm charging money, but I don't know for my coaching services, my business coaching services. However, my my true desire is I want to see you succeed. I I, mean, I don't care if I, if I'm charging you to say a thousand dollars a you know a month or two thousand a month or whatever it is. But, and then you all of a sudden, you've got a multi-million dollar company. I don't want now, well, now I want 10,000. No, it's, I mean, I'm here to be a service for you so that you can exceed to, to hit a much higher level. The fact that you hit those higher levels, to me, I would say, could you just leave me a nice testimonial? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that'd be my payback. Uh, so I can help other people do the same. So and it doesn't matter what your business is. Don't go in there looking at how much money you can make. It's how can I be of service? Here's an example. I, a previous client of mine, or actually she's still, she's still a current client. This is a previous session of ours. And she wanted to make $10,000 in her business. And she was like, how can I do this? I got to make the $10,000. Like, well, I said, I said, her name, don't think of this to make $10,000. That's the wrong way of looking at it. Look at it this way. How can I serve, let's say 10 other people and charge them $1,000? Is it the same result? Yeah. One is, one is thinking of the money. You don't care about the tactic, which is not a winner's mindset. The other one is like, how can I service 10 people at a thousand dollars or four people at $2,500? No, whatever the number is, how can I service them, providing them value that gives me the same result that I want? It's a different, it's the same result, but it's a different way of thinking about it. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and it's, and it's almost like you're, you're now thinking of the value that you're adding and the service that you're giving more as you change into this mindset, because you're more aware of it as, as you're, yeah, as you're giving value, you're also getting it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the thing is, this is what I found out that I've discovered with quite a few different entrepreneurs. And I've been, I I do a podcast myself where I interview other entrepreneurs as well. And one of the biggest things, and I, I don't know how big your audience is or what level they are in their entrepreneurial business, I can almost guarantee you that this is going to be true to your clients, as it has been with my clients, as well as other people that I've interviewed, is yeah. that 
most people undervalue themselves when they're getting started in business. They undercharge. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's usually because of their, the, their own mindset of value. They're going to say, well, I don't think I'm worth it. Like, well, number one, not only are you worth it, you should put an add an extra zero to that number. <laughs> That's the, the, to, in all honesty. And, and, but the thing is, once you start giving that value out there, then you start, then a lot of those people or most of those people start realizing, oh, I am a lot more valuable. And then they, they will increase their prices to be at the level that they're, that they're serving. So I would just say to your clients, don't undervalue the service or the, or the value that you're providing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And what are some ways that people can overcome that mindset that they're, they don't feel of worth uh, with their product or business? What are some uh, ways to notice that are to get, get over that, that hunch? And I mean, because it's all about your own self-confidence. That's what it, that's what it boils, boils back down to. Yeah. Is, okay, if you're going to uh, start to say, oh, I'm going to charge $1,000 an hour or $1,000 a session or $1,000 a month, you know, whatever it is. Um, if you, if you, if, I would say push your comfort zone a little bit, add, add 25% to it and, uh, and, and, then, and, and then start there. And then um, one, of the, one of the things that a, a previous mentor of mine has said and it was once five people are willing to pay you uh, the value that you're, that you're charging, it's time to raise your prices. Mm-hmm. So yeah. if five people are willing to pay you a thousand dollars, let's say you're, you're giving talk in the front of the room and you should say your second or third time in front of the room and you have a thousand dollar product and you've got 10 people going in the back to the room. It's like, okay, next time I give a talk, it's going to be 1250. <laughs> I've got to increase my price. Yeah. I wouldn't know that that, and then let's say you raise the 1250, you still got five or 10 people. You raise yeah. it again, you raise it again. It's supply and demand. demand. <laughs> yeah. It's supply and demand, but then when it gets to the point where, where somebody says, hey, I'm, I'm charging $6,000 and you know, previously you're just charging five and you got $6,000 and you know you nailed it and you had no people going to the room and these were qualified people in the, in the audience. Like, okay, so I've, I've, hit, I've, I've hit my ceiling. <laughs> I can go back down to the 5000 again. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's how you, I mean, it's, it's all part of A-B testing. It's all part of testing the market. Mm-hmm. Yeah. A lot of it does come down to sales. What is your um, experience with sales and what is the way that you tell people to go forward in, in their selling? Well, uh, it's number one, I said, don't be too salesy. Always provide value. Uh, I would even say give your best stuff you know, uh, to them at the front end so they know. I mean, I don't know if you follow a gentleman by the name of Brendan Burchard. He's always yeah. giving a lot of value. And the thing is, he's probably, and he probably gets so much value that all of the, all of the, if you watch all of his videos, you've got everything you need for free. But the thing is, um, provide that value as much, as much as you can. And, and therefore you're not selling, but you're, you're showing them, Hey, this is, this is what I, what I can do. Um, a gentleman by the name of Justin Livingston says it uh, perfectly. He says, you know, have to help, help them discover where they are now. He calls it your pain island and then what you are providing is the pleasure island as to where where can they go the mechanism from the pain island to the pleasure on this matter if you're on a ski boat or you're or on skis on a speed boat on a rowboat on a canoe doesn't matter the mechanism doesn't matter it's you helping them get to that to that uh, to that end result so as far as as long as you're being authentic and you have a, a true product or true service then i feel that you can um, that you, you, you shouldn't, you should, you should be doing fine. And once you start getting those sales done, that's going to be huge to your self-confidence. That's going to help you like, okay, uh, what I'm, it's going to r- remind you like, yes, what I'm doing is providing value. And when you see people making those changes uh, in their lives, regardless, it doesn't matter again, if it's a product or a service, um, then I know for me, that's when I feel worthy. I mean, Back in the day, before I did all of this, I used to be a college math teacher. And one of the things uh, a lot of teachers and those coaches are the same way is that I felt bad when my students did not do well in my class. Mm-hmm. I thought it was, a, to me, it was, a, it, was, it, was, it, was a, it was a personal insult when somebody, I had to get somebody an F. I hated that. Mm-hmm. But then, and that took me a couple of years I had to get past, uh, get past that. But then I started realizing it's also about the effort of the student. If the student is putting together no effort, I have no control over that. Mm-hmm. So 
but when the there were, but when I had those students that I knew that made A's and B's in the class, and I knew I was a, uh, I was a, a tough math teacher. I was, I was deliberately, I, I, I was deliber- deliberately harder on my students than other teachers were on their students. But I taught them differently. And uh, when I saw those people making those A's and those B's, I knew like, these are the, these are the rock stars. These are the people that are gonna go far. And, and when I saw them, especially if they were repeat students of mine, because they took them uh, one level class, the next level and the next level, they were uh, repeat students of mine. And I saw them making A's throughout. I was like, and I, to me, I was, I, I was so, I don't want to say overwhelmed, but I was, uh, I was truly appreciative of, of, uh, of what I was able to embark onto them. And the fact that they listened and they understood and they actually, they actually took it to their own practice. Same with my coaching business. When I see somebody, and goes from point A to point B, and they're achieving the goals that they that they've established at the front end, and they're hitting those goals. It's like to me, it's, it's, it's a true testament of somebody that's doing phenomenal. Now, I also have uh, clients that that aren't succeeding, and I mean, I do my best to figure out what is your why. What, you know, what 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 is it that why do you why why is it that you want what you say you want? And if you're not hitting those goals, then we have to reestablish your why. I mean, yeah. either your why is not strong enough or you gave me a BS why. Yeah. Can you give me why that really wasn't that, that strong of a why for you? Mm-hmm. Um, that's, that's where I go with that. <laughs> kind Definitely. Of. I think uh, the two things that you mentioned, uh, the terms of effort, the effort that the client or the student that you're teaching the, is putting forth shows the commitment to you as a... Or to themselves. And, and, and to themselves in their own practice, right? Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, it's it's really double the effect that they're getting from really putting that forth. In terms of somebody who's not really, let's say, they don't know what coaching is or they don't enjoy mathematics or how did you change that kind of, um, that understand, like as they stepped into it, how did you figure out a way to, still make it fun for you and fun for them? Well, uh, for me, it's all about, uh, and I'm going back to my math teaching because that's probably the most visual. Because like, coaching, I mean, it's, it's just a little harder to do. But w- w- back when I was um, uh, being a math teacher, I would go into the front of the room, and I was young. I mean, I was in my 30s back then. So sometimes my students were older than I was. Mm-hmm. And I just made the class very fun. I mean, I would wear short pants. I sometimes would curse in front of the group. And I said, I'm just going to be me. I'm not going to be your math teacher that speaks with the bow tie turned on, uh, on and speaking in monotone. Blah, 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 blah. I'm not going to be that person. So I have to make it fun. Yeah. Um, I did not tell you this earlier, but before I was a math teacher, I was a math tutor. So I, I would have people come into the, into the math lab at the different colleges that I worked at. And uh, there's a, how do you do, how do you add two fractions together? Okay. So this is basic math. And somebody else comes to me, how do you do this derivative? Okay, now we're dealing with calculus one. Well, somebody else goes, how can you do these, um, uh, this partial differential equations? Okay, now we're gonna have to go to PDEs. Mm-hmm. So you know, you had to be able to jump around. Yeah. Thing is, I always showed them the shortcuts. I showed them the why behind the math. I didn't go to teach the uh, a sub zero plus a sub one plus a sub two equals, uh, I don't go to teach you theory. I don't care, about, uh, the theory is irrelevant. The other math teachers will teach you theory. We'll touch on it so you have an idea, but this is, what, this is what it really means. So when I was a math teacher, I taught them as a tutor. I taught them the shortcuts. I taught them the why. And I, and I made it fun as well. Um, since I was already had an entrepreneurial uh, mindset going and starting at that time, anytime I had word problems, I made them all entrepreneurial problems. You own a dealership. You own seven green Saturns. You own eight uh, red Saturns. You own nine uh, black Saturns. What is your ratio of green to black Sa- uh, uh, Saturns that you have? Well, that's okay. That's seven to nine. But I always start off in you. You have your own dealership. Um, mm-hmm. So I always made it fun with them, and I, you know, I would joke with them. I, you know, I, yeah. the reason, and I do that same with my coaching, is because I know if you're in my class, you have a phobia on math. Mm-hmm. I'm teaching a developmental type class. I'm teaching the lower level classes. Mm-hmm. So I already know you have a phobia. So we have to break down that phobia. We have to get past that, that stale, that monotone, that, that, that thing with my coaching business. You have a fear of something. 
you're not hiring me as your coach because you, uh, you know what you're doing. You're hiring me because you have a fear. You have a setback. You have something that's holding you back. So let's make this fun. Let's make this real. But yeah, also make this informative. Going back to the math teaching, um, I would teach people like, instead of like, how do you, uh, convert, and one of the easiest ones that most visual ones I could do is, I call it unit conversions. Mm-hmm. Let's say you're going to change grams divided by uh, kilometers, and you want to change it to pounds um, by mile. You know, we know whatever it is. And there might be a, a conversion for that. Like, here's the simple ratio for that. I would not teach them that. I'll teach them what I learned in chemistry is doing, if you got a gram in the numerator and you got a gram in the denominator and you got your gram to, uh, let's call it a pound or gram to kilograms, you need to get kilograms to pounds. Um, you had that conversion where well, the gram in the numerator and the gram in the denominator have to cancel out. I mean, that's just simple. Two times three over two times five, the twos cancel out. I mean, exact same concept. I would right. teach them that. Most people's final exam would like, how do you change miles per hour to kilometers per second? You know, whatever that is. I would say, how do you convert miles uh, times grams times cubic centimeters divided by uh, um, uh, kilometers by liter by, you know, like four different, uh, uh, three units in the numerator and three units in the denominator. If you knew how to, how to do numerator, how to, how to cancel those out the gram over gram out, then you can do everything that you want. So I'm teaching them this whole thing. So let's say I'm teaching them math 50, but I'm teaching them math 80 skills in math 50. If they don't have me in math 60, when they go to the next class, how are they going to do in that class? They're going to rock it because they, they understood the skills. Mm-hmm. So the same thing with me as a coach is like, what, you know, how, can we, how can we get you past this point A to point B? But I, want, I don't want to get you to point B. I want, I want you to get you to point D or point E. Mm-hmm. Point B is just your stepping stone. It's going beyond it. Yeah. yeah. Right. It's like this old saying is if you want to aim for the moon, if, you, if your goal is the moon, aim for the sun. And if you hit the moon, oh well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's yeah. great. And um, going back to where you're mentioning fear, a lot of yes. people have this mindset where either we have to be fearless or we going using, utilizing the fear or following the fear or just having, feeling the fear, doing it anyway. What is your method of, of tackling fear in your own uh, coaching and, and your own business or your own life? That's a very good question that you asked. Um, and another part of my life background, which is, I have such a, ver- a varied background. Back yeah. when I lived in North Carolina, I used to do stunt work. Mm-hmm. And I used to do uh, mainly on independent films. You know, we, I've been on fire. I've done car stunts. I've done horse stunts and been blown up a few times. <laughs> and um, the thing is with fear, like you, the very first thing you said, you have to be fearless. And I'm going to tell you right now, that is the worst advice that I would say, give anybody. Because it's not about being fearless. It's about controlling your fear. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I mean I've, I've heard sayings that Jerry Seinfeld still has butterflies in his stomachs when he, right before he goes out on stage. So what happens in, in like in the stunt industry or in anybody that does anything with the adrenaline sports, fear keeps you sharp. Fear keeps you, because once you become fearless, then you, be, then you become careless. Right. There's going to be that, that bungee jumper that's about to jump off his, uh, you know, 300th bridge and he's about to he's about to jump off and he forgot to put on his bungee uh, his, uh, he forgot to, to connect himself to the bridge because you know he's just he's just acting um completely fearless um let's say uh, a pilot a pilot knows how to turn on the engine of, of the jet plane and fly it but he still goes through his checklist i mean you you the fear the controlling the fear is what keeps you sharp now you cannot let the fear impede you though you must control it and then use that uh, to, uh, to your advantage. Um, back in the back when I was doing stunt work, let's say if I was going to jump out of a four-story window into an airbag, and I'm like, is that is the FX guy, the special effects guy, is he going to break the window in time? Am I going to hit? The, is the airbag full of air? Is this? Uh, and, and I'm going through all these little what ifs and these things going on, and then all of a sudden I hear, um, uh, you know, I, I hear from the director, quiet on the set, roll camera. Roll sound, action. And now that's to my cue to go. Do I just like, oh, should I do this? Should I? Gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> you just gotta go, yeah. Um, I, a quote that I, uh, I and, I've, and I'm starting to work on some of my own quotes. One of the quotes that I talk about with fear is this one right here. 
and I, and I came up with this quote when I was skydiving. Mm -hmm. And the quote was, all it takes is one quarter second of non-hesitation, and then you're in the moment. Mm -hmm. And the skydiving thing is, you're letting go of the strut of the airplane. You got the parachute on, obviously. You let go of the strut of the airplane, you started falling away. That, that one quarter second. Well, you cannot get back in the airplane now. <laughs> you're in the moment. You're yeah. skydiving now. Yeah, <laughs> there, no yeah. turning back. Freaking out is not going to help you. Right. So, I mean, freaking out is like, okay, now, you know, like say if you're about to step on the stage and is that, and introducing Kevin Dunlap and I stepped that one, uh, that one foot outside the curtain, I'm now committed. So once you, once you decide to do something and you commit, regardless if there's fear or not, having fear, uh, it, it will keep you sharp, keep you aware, but also still just continue on. There is no turning back at that point. Right and do the best you can, yeah. And it does uh, have an incredible impact on one's confidence too when you do overcome the fear too. We overcome when you've, uh, uh, when you accomplish something in spite of the fear. In spite of fear. You, yeah. you may not overcome the fear, but you've done it in spite of. I mean, the perfect example is go, go to a Toastmasters. Uh, they're all over the world. Go to a Toastmasters and join one and give your first, uh, your first talk. It's called your icebreaker talk. It's a four to six minute talking about yourself. Once you've done that first talk, I mean, I know when I gave my first one, I was like pacing back and forth. I rehearsed it for hours. A friend of mine came to pick me up to take me to, to, to the Toastmasters. And I rehearsed it in front of her. And I was nervous as heck in front of just doing my friend. I'm about to go to do it in front of 15 people. But the thing is, after I did it, it's like, okay, done that. I didn't die. So <laughs> yeah. I can do it again. And then the second time, you get a little bit better. And third time and fourth time, it doesn't matter. Like, say you're giving your first sales pitch. You may do well. You may suck. It doesn't really matter. You've got, you've got, you've got, you got past it. You survived it. Now let's do it again. Let's, let's improve your skills. Absolutely. In, in terms of my own coaching, I, I deal with a lot of clients who are really afraid of public speaking and performance anxiety and that kind of stage fright. And so one of the things that I say is to imagine that you're floating on a cloud because the immediate thing that people always say is that, oh, think of people naked in the crowd, but that, that's even worse. I mean, <laughs> that's just the worst uh, like stereotype that people have made for that. <laughs> it just doesn't work. And so as you're focusing more not on the fidgeting of your hands or not on the shaking of your knees, but really you're, you're putting the focus more at the bottom of your feet as if you're on a cloud, it really helps to channel that energy down and through your body instead of it being like your, your um, idiosyncrasies as you're performing. So yeah, that's really interesting that I definitely think of doing a Toastmasters. <laughs> I think that's going to help me in my public speaking. And I mean, uh, Toastmasters is good for certain things and it's not good for others, but it's yeah. good. It's good for being in front of the room and it's good if you want to compete. Now, if you're, if you're looking to become a trainer, that's a different complete, uh, that's a completely different uh, speaking style. But uh, yes, uh, Toastmasters is good to get you at least started being in front of other people or, and being judged because uh, you're going to have an evaluator. Somebody's going to judge you. <laughs> um, yeah. But my, my suggestion to people that, that are wanting to do more speaking stuff, you may not like what I'm going to say. Uh, you may not agree. Well, I don't care if you agree or not. But the, 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 what I would strongly suggest is videotape yourself. Because mm -hmm. yeah, um, the thing is, the evaluators are going to say, hey, Kevin, you did this with your left hand. Uh, whenever you were talking here, you moved to your right. You should have moved to your left. And or somebody said, well, you spoke too fast or, you know, whatever it is because of your nerves. You go back and watch your own video. You're watching yourself like, OK, yeah, that's what I need to improve. That's where I need to improve. You're not you're not recording yourself to judge yourself. You're recording. So how can I improve upon that physical evidence that was right there in front of me on the on the video of, 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 of doing that? And I, I know what I do now is on my Toastmasters talk, I make them Facebook lives. I mean, yeah. Not only am I. Not only am I <laughs> recording it i'm recording it in front of the world live if i don't have an internet connection then i just record it uh, uh for the uh, on my cell phone mm -hmm. but you now that's you know that's the, the easiest way to improve is to videotape doing something even if you're doing a sales call record the sales call or at least record your side of the sales call in case you don't want to you know because you, you can always 
and get a camcorder recording at least your side. You, you won't hear the other person's voice, so you're not violating any things there. But what are you doing with your hands? Or uh, what kind of body language are you doing where you're on the phone? Are you leaning forward or are you leaning back? Which, which is going to be better for you? So that's, you know. It's very interesting to note your body language even during uh, the sales call. That's very important, I think. Okay, let me ask you this. Have you ever had a phone call with somebody and you could tell they were smiling on the other side? Yes, absolutely. Have you ever had a call where you, you knew they were not smiling, they were frowning on the other side? Yeah. It's through so, the yes. tone. Yeah. It's through the tone. And, and yeah, exactly. A lot of my, my podcasts are, it's not only is it video like this one, is, but it's also audio. When I'm going back and editing, I can tell when I'm smiling. Right. <laughs> so that, come, that comes across. So if you're talking to somebody, um, smile. Um, I know when I'm uh, talking to somebody, I usually, I'm, I'm, sometimes I'm pacing because it's, it's the nervous energy, but it also gives me more energy in the call. If I'm just sitting on the, uh, sitting here at my desk like I am right now, I may not as be as, as energetic on the phone. So if I'm going back and forth and I'm consciously smiling, when I'm saying goodbye to everybody, I'm always smiling. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I don't care if it's faked or not. I mean, I'm always smiling because I want to exude that energy into the, 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 my departing words on the phone. Great. Yeah, I always say that anxiety is excitement with judgment. <laughs> so once you remove the judgment, uh, you focus more on the excitement part. Yes. What are some ways that you um, tackle judgment or negative self-talk? Because um, I'm going to tell you, every, uh, everybody judges. I don't care who you are uh, or what you say or what you do. Everybody judges. Right. I mean, um, but you, you, but you're talking about judgment of self, right? Um, when we are judging ourselves uh, in a negative light, then that to me means we have we, and this is even with other people, then that's a failed uh, expectation. Yeah. So if I'm judging myself, <laughs> that means I expected something different. I expected something more that I did not receive. Right. So it's like, okay, why why am I judging myself that way? And then like, okay, and then you can flip that around. We call it reframing. How, how can I reframe this outcome, this situation to actually be, uh, be, be, be screwed from a, from a different perspective, from a more positive perspective. Mm -hmm. So if I, if I catch myself doing that, it's like, okay, there was a failed expectation. How can I do this differently? How can I do this better? And try to lead, stay in the negativity side of this as little as possible. I mean, that's, that's all there is. Uh, that's, to me, that's all there is to that. And then, and then do a reassessment. Like, okay, how can I do this differently now? Or how can I look at this from a different perspective? Absolutely. Well, you've had some many, many great pointers and advice for us today. Uh, I normally like to uh, leave the podcast with you saying something that really resonates with you currently, uh, like an epiphany that you've had, an aha moment that you've had recently. Um, and so do you have something that pops into mind right away? Um, usually when I'm signing one of my books, I'm, I'm now right. I used to write Zig Ziglar's, uh, quote, if you could dream it, you can achieve it. That's, that's one of my biggest ones. But right now I'm more along the lines of live with your passion, find, find your passion and live your passion. Live with it. Right. That's great. Because awesome. if you're not living your passion, then, then what are you doing? What are you living? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's great that's great thanks for being a part of this journey with me kevin and we uh we've had a many great topics that we've covered i hope that people get value from this and i'll talk to you again sometime i'd love to catch up so <laughs> that's my pleasure right. i'm glad to be on your show and i and i'd say that i thank everybody that that's out in your audience that's, uh, that's actually listening to the show thank you Awesome. All right. Thanks for being here, man. My pleasure.